think the impact of these new policies coming out of President Trump's administration will be? Let me ask you about that. I mean, in particular, as it relates to the financial services sector, Dodd-Frank, how much different will that legislation look, in your view, based on what you've heard and, and spoken about with the president? Well, there's a lot of discussion. There was actual work done before the president uh, got elected that, you know, the idea of removing some of the burdens from small banks, I think that's generally agreed to. Uh, changing the uh, level of work it takes to comply, that's an agreement. And so I think it'll just make, the dialogue will be about, okay, how can we accomplish the purposes? Better capital, better liquidity, not having a financial crisis again, the stress testing, how you resolve the big banks, those types of things. That, that's a given. The question is, can you get the balance right on how much work it takes to make that all happen? And I think that's what uh, the market and the, uh, the, you know, the industry is looking forward to having that dialogue about how to keep the balance in that, and we'll see what plays out. So in addition to your you know, focus on costs, making sure you're taking costs down, as you have been, does that add a whole nother layer of, of goodness for you and for Bank of America, given that the regulatory burden changes? Well, we, we had built a pretty good architecture in the 9, 10, 11, 12, where we had doubled the size of a lot of our control functions. They've been relatively constant while the rest of the companies come down. So, yes, it creates an environment where that ratio ought to be a little bit more rational. But, but remember, at the same time we're taking out costs, we're investing heavily. So we have more salespeople than the company's ever had. We have $3 billion a year going into technology investments uh, every year. We have you know, investments in you know, simplifying processes. Last year, we, we, we took, had 1,000 ideas to take out $400 million operating expenses. Granular, simple stuff would be tedious to your, to your viewers, but this is what makes a company work. And so you're investing all the time, and we call that being sustainable and because we have to be investing in the future. We cannot take the cost down and not add more teammates in the wealth management business or the consumer business or the commercial banking business who are going out and handling customers and doing great jobs. So what, what, if there's a shift that we have to spend less on you know, resolution planning because we're almost done with that, we can then fold that money into adding more salespeople. What about, what about corporate taxes? If we see 15% corporate tax rate, what does that mean for your business? We're, we're a full taxpayer, but it would be good for us. And you know, I think you know, the idea of the American tax rate being too high is not a, a new idea. It's been, there's been a lot of discussion for years. The question is how do you negotiate a tax plan that actually takes into account. And this is hard work, so I think this will take a, some time for people to get all the thoughts around. There's an intention to fix it, but it, our rate is relative to the rest of the world is very high. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's why I asked you, because coming from a 35% rate, which you pay, other companies may use all the loopholes in, in the world, but you're actually paying 35%, taking it to 15% for tells you the investor costs are really going to improve if, if does that i mean there are analysts that say a 15 percent corporate tax rate adds 20 percent to earnings does that sound right to you yeah I, I i don't have the math off the top of my head but it'd be, <laughs> it'd be better to have a lower tax rate for the bottom line no question I, i'd say all right let me ask you about president trump's meeting with british prime minister Theresa may sure. you've got business obviously in the uk may has made it clear that britain will leave the european union obviously brexit is looking for that quick trade agreement with the u.s have you decided what your plans are in terms terms of the people you have in London, the people you have in Britain versus moving them to somewhere else in the Eurozone? Well, a group of us met with Mrs. May, uh, Prime Minister May, last week, and, and I found it clarifying in that she, you know, she gave the speech the day before, so she you know, she's, has a task and she's going to drive through that task. The question is how do we react to that task, and, and the problem is we don't know the rules yet. So a lot of us are saying we've got five scenarios, but until we understand how it's going to operate, it's a little hard to do. And it's real people and real human beings, and so I'd say stay tuned on that. It, it's premature to say you hear a lot of stories about you know, this city or that city. That's premature because you don't know the rules of operation yet. It is a serious change for our peers and ourselves relative to what London meant because it was a place to consolidate all kinds of activities, sometimes because they're EU related, but once you get to size, just like we have in New York, or just like we have in Charlotte, you end up collecting things around it. This puts that all in question. And so what we're trying to do is figure out the rules. And then I think what we're asking, what, the, what we need is an implementation period, not a transit, but an implementation period that's long enough that once the rules are set, you can actually change the systems over and build it. On a, on a short-term basis, we're ready, ready to operate you know, literally in two places with a bank and a securities firm in the EU and one in the UK, because that's going to be a ticket to admission. After that, we have to wait till the, res the rules get played out. But would you like, if, if you could, would you like to keep as many people in London as possible? Would you like to stay where you are? I'd, I'd like to be least disruptive to 
the economies in that part of the world and the markets in that part of the world because those markets and economies are still recovering. They're, fi they're finally growing. The last thing you need to do is have any disruption to the depth of, of the capital markets to support European growth, the depth of the capital markets to support UK growth. And, and you know, that's the conundrum they're in. They're trying to do something which is unprecedented at the same time not disrupt the economies. And, I, and we're in the middle of that question, not because we drive it, because we translate it. And mm -hmm. so if you disrupt the capital markets, they become less deep. That's not good. And so that's what we don't want disruption. It's not just where people are. It's really we don't want disruption to the economies because at the end of the day, just like in the U.S. or anywhere else, if the economies are good, banking's good. Yeah, for sure. All right, let, let me ask you this because we're seeing technology being used increasingly in the banking sector. You just said you're investing more in technology. What is that going to mean for people? I mean, does that mean fewer branches? Does that mean new ways of doing things? What's your ultimate goal and how does banking look different, let's say, in the next three years? The answer is yes to all that. Yeah, and, okay. and that's been the interesting thing. Well, people have thought about our company over the last several years, you know, clean up the mortgage mess and everything. We've actually been driving a huge transformation in the company, digitizing it. There's a lot of you know, words people use. But the easiest way for people to think about is in our retail platform. So in 2007 or 8, we hit the peak in our branches, 6,100. 6, We're down to about 4,600, 45, high 4,500 today. We had 100,000 teammates. We now have 60. The sales capacity has gone from 15,000 people up to 25,000 people. You know, 50 percent of all the deposits made by consumers at Bank of America are made by taking a picture on their phone and sending them in. But there's still 30 percent that people hand a teller. There's still five million people that go in a week in a teller. So the integrated model, and that's where the real hard, interesting work comes in. So we have 50,000, 40, 50,000 people. We set an appointment on their mobile phone to go into a branch, which helps us be ready for them. So it's the integrated model. And that, but that technology transformation, think about 1,500 less branches. 40,000 less people. Yeah. And so one of the obligations we have the company is how do we retool on that and do it in a fair way for our teammates, our shareholders, and our customers. And it's, it's a fascinating transition. But this, that's only one business. You can take that in the commercial yeah. business. You can take that in the wealth management business. You can take it in all the things. It is an unbelievable transformation. Yeah. Happening. Where so, does the most revenue growth come from in the coming year? Well, it comes from uh, the rise in net interest income, which really benefits the traditional banking businesses. And then if the markets, you know, the markets business and the wealth management business grow, but all the businesses should see revenue growth and market share growth because we have the best in the world and they got to go out and win. If they don't, they're not doing the right thing. Spoken like a winner. Brian, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Brian Moynihan, CEO of Bank of America. And we'll be